time of the year is the start of our harvest season. And the start of our harvest season usually starts with heron eggs. When the heron move into the beach to spawn, we wait, watch, watch, and as soon as it starts spawning, we set out our poles, tie up one line to the beach, one line to the anchor out in the sea, and we fill up our poles with trees. We put that, tie a tree onto the pole and leave it there for about three or four days to let the herring spawn on it. And when it gets thick enough like that, we pick it up to take home and we peel it and put it away. Herring is just a really key species, not only from a cultural perspective, but from a whole ecosystem perspective. I mean, it feeds, you know, whales, salmon, I mean, feels terrestrial mammals like, you know, wolves and bears that come down during spawn. Uh, and then culturally, I mean, it's just, uh, just tremendously important. These ones, can you eat the kelp with it? Yeah, you cook too. Yeah? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Just eat it like this? Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Delicious. Hi, I'm Karen Meyer, producer of the Great Bear Sea documentary. We're here on the central coast of British Columbia to witness the spectacle of the herring spawn and to meet with First Nations and scientists who are working together to save the herring. When are herring? When do they come here? When do you see them? Well, they're basically here, here all year round, but it's, it just go to a certain spot to spawn. Like Kittishu Bay is one of them. And also through the pass here. Years ago it used to spawn right down the end of the island, all the way up to the top end of the island. That was years ago, but uh, there are things that happen where, where it spawn, stops spawning here, but the herring are still there, eh? All around Easter time that they, that they move in and until they're ready to lay their eggs, they all mill around the bay by the thousands, you know, by the, they go by the tonnage, eh? and you get the sea lions all feeding, and the comeback whales all feeding, the cormorants, the eagles, and ravens, just all along just the beach, waiting up in the trees, watching. So this is a big, big change for them. They, and every one of them, like, would grab a and eat it, go back, grab another one, grab another one. So that's that's part of the what we call our harvest season. That's, that's that's the start of it. If you go out to Kitasu Bay during the spawn, you can see hundreds of sea lions, dozens of whales. There have been hundreds of eagles. The amount of wildlife out there is astounding. And so the herring are a vital source of energy for the entire ecosystem, including the local First Nation population. And so that's where my interest lies, is that it's a key part of the ecosystem and if we don't treat it properly, if we don't fish it responsibly, then it has massive consequences not only on the people, but on the ecosystem. Marcus and his team are collaborating with Central Coast First Nations to look at recent changes in the behavior of herring. Collaborative research such as this builds on First Nations traditional knowledge and the tools science can provide. Where my project comes in is the spawn on kelp fishermen have been noticing over the past few years really deep spawns. Now, herring typically spawn in the shallow of the intertidal. You can often see it on the shoreline at low tide. But they've been noticing spawns that are as deep as 30 or 40 meters below the surface. And that's really uncharacteristic. It's not something that researchers or local fishermen have seen before. And there are a number of reasons why this might be happening, and there are a number of consequences that could result from that. Up in the shallow, you got the surface current where, you know, everything's moving back and forth, and you know that the sperm is fertilizing eggs. 
Whereas at 100 feet, you don't have as much current, you don't have the swells. So how much of those eggs are getting fertilized? How much of them actually survive anyway, right? That's one of the unknowns, I would say. It could be temperature induced, so it could be a result of recent climate change or El Nino. We have warmer water in here now, and the herring may be diving deeper to find the colder water that they're accustomed to. It could also be a result of large aggregations of predators. If you have a large amount of predation on the surface, then the herring may dive deep to get away from the predation. And for the same reason, they might be doing that with vessel traffic. So that's another hypothesis. And one of the challenges that we're facing right now is that a lot we don't know about Pacific herring in terms of how they move, how they behave as, are they one huge population, or are they all very small pockets of populations that operate independently. Because we don't know a lot of those things, the assumptions about how we think herring populations operate have very strong impacts on the kind of risks that are imposed by fishing. And so we use a combination of field methods and mathematical modeling to try to understand those, those trade-offs between do we take a lot of fish and leave just a little or do we leave a lot and just take a little? And how do we allocate how the fishery is, is executed in space and time? So there's different kinds of people that use herring for different reasons and how do we balance the trade-offs of the needs of those different kinds of people and the ecosystem. Over time, it will start tipping. Get to a point where it tips over, and that's that's when they that's when they sort of uh, connect that with the herring. As the herring tip over to spawn, that's what that's the term that they use is when they go and kelp, they just spawn on the sides, and that's uh, that's what they watch. Is the moon tipping over coincides with the herring when they start spawning when they tip over on the side to spawn. So that's, that's one of the ways that they, they connect with uh, you know, having, having no calendar, having no tidebook, having no GPS, having nothing. They just they all went by, by everything that they said is around them with nature. Right? Herring typically live up to about nine years and they'll spend their winters at really deep depths out in Hecate Strait and offshore. When the spawning season comes around, they'll start swimming into these areas of the coastline. There are different locations that they return to, the same spots every year, to spawn. And it's remarkable how accurate the timing is. So for the last three or four years in Kittisu Bay, the herring have spawned starting on roughly about March 28th. And that's exactly what happened this year. So it's a really interesting phenomenon. And before they spawn, you can go out there and all the wildlife has showed up because they're expecting it. So there's three types of herring fisheries in this part of the world. The first one is the commercial row fishery, and this is very industrial. They catch the fish before they spawn and to extract the row. They're catching reproductive adults and they're killing them. You also have what's called a commercial spawn on kelp operation. They're collecting only the herring eggs, but this is done in two ways. Some First Nations, they do it in what's called open ponding. So they're just setting the lines uh, where, her where herring are gonna spawn, as in the food fishery, but just at a much larger scale. And the other approach is to have the equivalent of basically a fish pen in which they catch a herring with, with a seine net, adult, put them into the, pen and they provide the kelp for them to spawn and they wait for them to spawn and once they spawn they release the adults and collect the eggs on the kelp for their own food use in a cultural context. First Nations go to spawning areas prior to spawn and they set hemlock boughs or kelp 
on lines at the bottom and then the herring come and spawn and the eggs collect on the hemlock boughs or the, or the kelp and they pull that up and they're covered with eggs that gets distributed in the community. There's a very strong cultural context to it as well as tremendous nutritional value to that food. And their view, which is completely consistent with scientific studies, is that if you harvest just the eggs rather than the adults that are about to reproduce, which is what the commercial fishery does, you have a much lower impact on the population. See how they make it too. They put rocks on there to keep it too, underwater. Oh, that's the rock? Yeah, okay. high rock on there. A lot of these ideas that we're considering have largely been fueled by the local people here. So they're here year-round, they've lived here for their entire lives, and they have observed these changes over time. And so they're telling us where they're observing this happening and giving these ideas of why it might be happening. And it's that collaboration with us at Simon Fraser University and the Central Coast Indigenous Resource Alliance and the people here in the community that is allowing this project to happen. The local people are really key to this because we have to travel to some really remote areas out on the outer coast to find these areas and to find where the herring are spawning, where they might be spawning deep. The local knowledge of where to go, how to find these places, and when we can go and cannot go. For example, today it seems common here, but out where our experiment site is, it's blowing 30 knots and it would be impossible to get any work done. So it was the locals who gave me that information and that's the reason that I've got a shore day today. The work on the 25 southeast won't be as bad, but if it's 25 northwest, it blows right in the bay and it stacks up the waves when the tides are coming up, so you get pretty deep chopped. It's not as much fun. So Wednesday, the forecast looks better. better. I mean, it's 10 to 20 going to light, and then it's crazy. It's light, light, light after that. Yeah. So maybe we just... Um... Tomorrow, we're going to head out into Kittusi Bay, and we're going to set up an experiment to test how depth affects um, herring eggs. And to do this, we're going to place eggs um, that we harvest from the natural spawn to three different depths in the bay. So the, we're gonna put them at 30 meters, at 15 meters, and at three meters. To do this, we're gonna have to have two dive crews out there. Um, one dive crew is going to be harvesting while the other dive crew is collecting the stuff from the harvesters and putting it into pre-constructed frames. And those frames will be lowered from the surface to the bottom and we will collect those eggs at different intervals. So I collect them just before they hatch and then I preserve them, bring them back to the lab and I can examine them with a microscope and see how well they've survived if a lot of them have died. And we'll also have uh, temperature, salinity and dissolved oxygen uh, loggers on those systems. Studying fish is like studying trees, except they're invisible and they move. And not only are herring like that, but also studying herring is like studying the, a vast majority of the ecosystem, right? So there's all these interacting pieces that we have a very limited understanding of. And yet human intervention is such that we like to try to simplify things so that we can manage it well. But in reality, management means considering all those different trade-offs between all the different players in the system. And that's something we're just starting to touch the tip of the iceberg of, in the sense that we have data on some of these things, but we don't really understand how they interact and how they're going to change in response to the, to the impending stresses of climate change. Had a lot of strong winds hitting out there, but uh, ran into rough water. We made it through there and managed to get everybody managed to get their stuff in what they needed to get in. But what we brought in there is not enough for the whole community. The same amount of trees I set was 12 in one area would fill this whole boat right up. Everything, every bin would have been full if there if it turned out good. But all three boats that were there this morning only had, like you said, two bins that you see in mine. Charlie's probably got two bins and that other boat had two bins where we usually come in with about four or five bins each and that's enough for the whole village to come down and 
take their share for the winter. But I'm gonna have to run out again tomorrow, reset the trees to see if we can get enough for the village there, but I doubt it. But right now we're just chasing a spawn that's gonna be moving. Usually the elders tell us there when the spawns in one area, it's gonna stay there, but once it gets disturbed by everything, I told my son on the way in, four things bothering the spawn. The first one there was uh, the whales. There's probably about a dozen humpback whales in there. Then you got about three or four pods of sea lions. And then you got the fishermen that's out there doing a row on kelp. And then you got us. Four things bothering the herring, so that's probably the reason why it didn't turn out as well. But maybe the stalks are weak too. That 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 could be another thing. We just gotta uh, look at it and then talk about it amongst ourselves and see what went wrong and what we could do a little bit better next year. Yes. Rather exciting about all this work that I'm involved in is that uh, it's not someone with an academic background like me coming into a place and bringing my own ideas and just making my own moves and making decisions as if I knew any better. It's about listening to people who have been living in place for many generations, who have a very long-term perspective, who have an intimate relationship with the resources that nourish them culturally, as well as economically and nutritionally, and saying, hey, we're noticing these changes. We understand a lot of this from our own perspective, but what can you as a scientist bring to you know, round out our understanding better? And that's a very enriching experience because it's the synergy of the old traditions and all of their wisdom and, you know, new tools that science can contribute. It just complements our understanding as well. And it's very gratifying where that request for scientific research comes from the First Nations themselves. And make sure to, to respect the area, not to ruin it for the future. Make sure that we're going to have enough going around there all the time, not to overtake, not to waste, not to be uh, disrespectful to any of the animals that are there. Just they're all there to feed as well as we're trying to feed ourselves. Make sure that uh, we're looked after well with whatever, whatever we got left there for the herring. So what different First Nations are trying to set up is areas that are exclusive for their harvest of herring eggs. So they're zoning areas that they want to keep just for their own harvest of eggs and they're saying when there's enough herring coastwide we can consider commercial row herring fisheries to open outside those areas. But there has to be a minimum threshold of, of abundance. We're trying to achieve a positive and collaborative relationship with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in which they contribute their substantial scientific expertise. We contribute scientific expertise and indigenous knowledge and indigenous laws and come up with a co-management structure that promotes access to this very important resource by First Nations, but also that promotes the conservation of herring in, in the whole ecosystem. If that is achieved, that we can you know, contribute to improved management so that other non-indigenous fishers can access herring as well. In addition to herring, recent collaborative research between First Nations and universities includes kelp and otters, bears and salmon, crab, rockfish, and birds. We don't want to be one of those people that say that we used to have salmon here, we used to have halibut, we used to have herring, we used to have oolakin, we used to, you know, uh, that's not something we want to do and that's why we want to be very proactive. We're prepared to do whatever it takes to make sure that we protect these resources and make sure that things are done in a sustainable way. We're working on marine planning with the province of British Columbia. So when we're getting involved with processes like MAP, we're doing a lot of science work, uh, we're incorporating a lot of our traditional ecological knowledge in terms of some of the management, uh, because we want to protect those. We want to make sure that people have the opportunity to still harvest those resources in the future. 
So I think just being able to uh, be a part of the decision making, I think will hopefully, uh, you know, bring better sustainability to our coast. So.